Hi everyone. When I finished my recent campaign during which I have used and played through a bunch of Patrick's products, I really wanted to talk to him and discuss about his work. Fortunately for me, there is this place called the internet and I was able to reach him out. He responded instantly and turned out to be a great guy. I am really satisfied that we could talk like two buddies in a bar. I hope you guys will enjoy this conversation. In the description of this video, I will leave Patrick's social media, his blog, his shop and drive through link where you can get Veins of the Earth. Now I will do a short introduction in Polish and the conversation will start. Cześć wszystkim. Ci z was, którzy śledzą mój kanał od jakiegoś czasu, wiedzą, że niedawno w ramach swojej zakończonej już kampanii udało mi się rozegrać Deep Carbon Observatory i Maze of the Blue Medusa. Gdy tylko zakończyliśmy ostatnią sesję, w mojej głowie zaczęła kiełkować myśl o tym, by skonfrontować swoje doświadczenia z Patrickiem Stewartem. Gdy parę tygodni temu wreszcie uzyskałem swoją kopię Veins of the Earth, podczas czytania pomyślałem, że muszę wreszcie zebrać się w sobie i skontaktować się z Patrykiem. Na szczęście wszystko poszło gładko, udało się znaleźć nam obu pasujący termin i nagrać rozmowę, którą za chwilę usłyszycie. Ja bawiłem się świetnie, a wy dajcie znać, co sądzicie. Okay, so to start, thank you, Patrick, for agreeing to do it, to do this. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here, and I am really thrilled to hear about about what you think about uh, the questions that I have for you, because uh, like like we talked a few seconds ago, I, I have run uh, I have run your products, and uh, I find them quite intriguing. And uh, if we could start with a short introduction from yourself about maybe who you are and uh, that that would be great for the start. Uh, hello, I'm Patrick Stewart. I started the blog False Machine roughly 10 years ago in 2011. And since then I've made a bunch of different adventures and different products for old school D&D. &D. You might know me from Deep Carbon Observatory, Veins of the Earth, or a bunch of others. Okay, thank you. So I will jump straight to the questions. Uh, so. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of uh, in the middle of reading veins of the earth, and I wanted to start a bit about veins, then then switch to other topics. But when reading veins, I cannot uh, cannot help myself, but I have this feeling that when reading the monsters, I'm feeling like I'm reading some kind of a biology book or or or, or some National Geographic stuff like that, and it's really intriguing because usually people depict the monsters as a, some, I don't know, fantasy poster. And, mm -hmm. and here with, with, with veins of the earth, you are presenting them as animals, I think, something like that. And, yeah. and what, was, this, was this an idea or was this an accident? Uh, it's mainly just a confluence of just my different influences, I think. So uh, from my, the, the sources I used, I read a bunch of books about biology and you know, geology, caving and stuff like that. My natural tendency when I'm creating anything is to try and, in most cases, to integrate it with some degree of pseudoscience or uh, some embodied reason of how it interacts with the world in which it's in. And that relates to old school D&D because... If you're playing like old school D&D in a rough sandbox fashion, it has a lot of freedom and expansiveness. And that means if you create a creature that's more of a um, more of like a, a funhouse dungeon creature or just a pure monster, then it feels it can feel out of place in a world. And since in sandbox or high freedom D and D, the people can always go and explore the world or they're meant to be able to investigate things and research things like explore, find out different solutions to problems and sign things themselves. If you make it more of a pseudo ecology of a monster, if you give it like a place and a thing that it's about other than just mon just being a monster, then it lets people do that. There's more to find out and different uh, DMs can integrate it into different worlds in various ways. Yeah, and I got to say that when reading them, I most of them, they seem alien, but uh, also when they are alien, they seem a bit common, like like you like you know them, like like this is something that you might have heard of, might have read somewhere or, or seen. So so it really gives the the the, the animal or or, this, or or a living thing vibe. Yeah, I stole a lot of it from the logic of um, cave organisms. Basically, a bunch of strange things happen when something tries to live in a cave. Uh, there's not much energy down there, so everything slows down. 
it means things can live a very long time because they're not doing much. So the uh, the Ulm, the salamanders, they exist in caves, insects and stuff like that. If they exist, it's usually near the surface, but they can live for ages and things down there can move super, super slowly. So you'll, just, you'll find something just hanging out on a wall for like 20 years, whereas up in the our world, it would just live and die over a couple of days. Uh, they lose pigmentation, obviously. Uh, a bunch of other things happen, like uh, fungi become, well, most of them are very vulnerable to fungi. Something happens with the uh, the ability of organisms to resist fungus, and it just like seems to collapse in caves a lot. So a lot of the stuff you notice in the organisms, the living ones in veins, is kind of like mad projections of stuff that happens to organisms in caves anyway. Some of it is fragments of geology or things that people imagine living in caves, and others is just me trying to work out how you can have something like a living being and something like an almost natural environment and have it still sort of make sense. Uh, so uh, how, what was the process of the research? Because it sounds like there was a lot of work to be done on, unless you're some super expert on, on caves and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, what was it a long period of time of research and of, of preparation? Yeah, I basically spent a lot of money on books about caving um, and tried to research as much as I could with my limited resources. Although I didn't go down in a cave. <laughs> um so there's a bunch of like opening books. I think the first one I read was a book called Blind Descent, which is kind of like a uh, a pop pop-sci adventure story documentary thing about uh, two groups of cave explorers who are trying to reach the deepest point on Earth. That was kind of the the inspiration. And then I expanded from there into stories of old cavers, like how caving happened, how cave exploration started to be a thing, and into geology, which is like the history of the Earth. That was important because... Uh, it's basically time written in stone. And one thing I really wanted to create with veins was this sense of overwhelming and oppressive time. And geology is basically about that. And the other one was weird cryptobiology and stuff like biologists finding archaea, then looking into cave organisms, trying to imagine what previous biologists or science or natural philosophers might have imagined being in caves and what people project might be hiding beneath the earth right now. So looked into all of that stuff as to a bit anyway, and then just embroidered it a lot with a lot of my own uh, creations. So, uh, because also also I think uh, that that's, that I get from veins is that everything there, like you said, perceives time in a different manner. So uh, usually, where where you think about some underground setting uh, in in the classic in classic D and D, for example, it's kind of uh, what we have above the ground, but a bit different, a bit much more evil, I would say. And here it's totally different. So also a question about veins. So where you were preparing to or writing veins of the earth, was this also a motivation to have a totally different different approach, not to not to copy paste and adjust a bit uh, uh, above above the earth world? Oh, yeah. I mean, I try to it's kind of a point of pride that I try to make everything that I do as original as I possibly can. And although I did learn a lot of new respect for other people who had done versions of the underground, because it's, it's very, there are a lot of problems out that are very hard to address. But yeah, I wanted to do something that was something that no one else had ever done before. And to be honest, I think I talk about in the introduction, caves in fiction and caves on TV and caves in books are relatively uninteresting. They're like a, a pantomime set of what they actually are. And if you look into what they actually are, they're these very beautiful and quite terrible and quite uh, awe-inspiring environments which are, feel deeply other. Listening and reading about the experiences of people who go caving, it for some people at least, it's a very kind of quiet semi-religious experience. If you stay down there for a long time, it become you can have awe-inspiring or can, like you can go from literally lying like a, you're squeezing through a letterbox for hour upon hour, trying to reach the end of something where you don't know if it even has an end, and then walk out into a cathedral no one's ever been in before in the history of the world. And that's a rare experience, but it's kind of yes, I wanted to. I was trying to steal the emotions of people, like cavers and cave explorers, and create that deep sense of wonder and otherness and ancientness, and just build it into a more D and D esque environment. Yeah, so so I I can I can assure you that reading it feels like the caves are were not made for people so mm. yeah so you're, you're an alien there so that's yeah. definitely the the feeling that's that i get at least from the veins 
I'm glad you got the feeling because, to be honest, I wanted to give people the impression, but it's also a confabulation because caves in real life really aren't made for people, and you can't yeah. go adventuring in them, you'll just <laughs> die. So you can't take the rope. They tend to be linear. There's no weird, as far as we know, well, hopefully there's no weird monsters down there. There isn't enough energy for civilization. So I wanted all those things to be in there, and I was like, how can I make this an adventure space without it, while still it's still feeling other? So I tried to locate the a kind of simulation of the resources you would need and imagine ways they could grow from kind of near reality or kind of dreamlike environments and situations. Yeah, so, so that also sounds very challenging when you are trying in the same uh, in the same situation to create an environment which is hostile, but it's also an environment that people have to go to advent- adventure there. Right. Yeah. That's like the entire. That's like the, the what I call like um, polarity of D and D in general. But it's exemplified in veins, which is you're trying to make this thing which is genuinely deadly and genuinely a challenge, and isn't easy to navigate. But secretly, really, on the flip side. You can navigate it, and the challenges probably are solvable somehow, and it's not just going to instantly kill you like a real environment in an unfair or uninteresting way. And that's kind of one of the reasons I've kind of learned a bit of new respect for the people who had done adventures before me, because I was like, fundamentally we're operating on the same axis, we're both trying to create this kind of... It's it's still a stage set, it's just like a really fancy gothic one. Um, it's like, for, instead of like it being easy, now it's difficult, but it's more like... Uh, you can still survive, or you can find ways to survive in of the Earth, whereas if it was a direct simulation of anything involved, you just die really quickly, and in a very boring way. So, like, if you, it's deliberately set so that the challenges lead to more drama, rather than just instant death. So you can run out of food, but you're probably going to find someone you can cannibalize, but then you have to cannibalize them, which is horrible. And you can get lost, but the punishment for that isn't that you die starving, it's more like you'll go insane or mutate, which are kind of, like, interesting... Uh, developments in a game rather than just okay, you die. Which yeah. is what happens in a real game if you <laughs> fuck up. So, uh, another question about uh, monsters in the veins uh, that I wanted to ask is the idea behind the descriptions of monsters, they are like, when you are describing what the monster is doing, you are describing what the monster is doing to me. And this uh-huh. is also something new. Uh, and uh, like, when 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 you are reading some monster manuals etc then it says this is the monster it has this ability they, these monsters do these things to these people and mm-hmm. i don't re- recall the uh, name i think is i Eigenrau or Eigenrau is the, this this monster that is eating eyes and, and skin and and you are describing that it's eating my eyes and my skin mm-hmm. so and it, it's new. It's it's really new, and uh, it feels m- much more intense when when reading when reading it. So again, was this uh, uh, was this your your purpose, your idea of how you showed them? It wasn't like a brilliant concept I had to begin with, but it just developed from the way I described things. I think I the original is. Because I didn't have an editor, I think if I've been writing it for a company or someone had been editing it, they would have said, hey, this is third person, this is second person, this is first person, it's all one paragraph. It doesn't make any degree of, um, it's not grammatically <laughs> correct, or it doesn't make sense as, like, from any particular point of view, what you're doing, whereas, because I was, I decided, I went very hard on the prose, all of the Veins monsters got more rewrites for the prose than I think anything else I've ever done. I basically thought, when I was writing them, Go from idea to idea. As long as people understand like the concept of the creature, like they don't need it to be like the for the text to be like uh, scientifically or grammatically to be distant. You can slip from first to second person. You can be looking at the monster, then it's attacking you, and then you can go to like a kind of scholarly description of its environment. You can do all of that in one in one stretch of text. So long as it makes sense to the reader and they can feel it, you can do a lot of weird stuff with the kind of. I think you're right in. Fire in the Velvet Horizon about the point of view of the monster manual writer, if you imagine a person writing it, makes no sense yeah. in terms of any actual real person. Like They know a magical degree of stuff about one thing and then other things are mysteries. They describe things as if they're meeting them and then as if they're scientific problems and then as if like well, how much treasure it has. It's like, it doesn't it doesn't make any any it doesn't make any technical sense, theoretical sense, but it does work. And as long as it works, and it like gives people the energy and the feeling they need to make the monster in their heads and then to describe it to the players, then it's a good monster description. 
I don't know if you're if you're familiar with uh, Warhammer Fantasy uh, line, but the Monster Manual, the, the bestiary for for Second Edition, it was very cleverly split in, into parts where. One was the how how monster is seen from people's perspective, and second was the mechanical stuff. So mm-hmm. so so that's 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 the one that that I like how it was solved at least. But like you say, the the, the perspective that this is a scary monster, but it also has this much tre- treasure, and yeah, it's it's weird. So when creating a big project, when you are working on a big project like Veins, what was the biggest challenge? Like, because it's enormous. I think it's it's the biggest uh, product that Lamentations has published. Mm. So what was the, the hardest stuff? Uh, to be honest, it wasn't meant to be that big at any point. I had the plan of doing something like Vornheim, basically, but for caves. And then it, I, I couldn't do that. And it just expanded and expanded and expanded. And I set myself these arbitrary problems of like excuse me okay i'll do this many caves and stop i'll do this many treasures then stop i'll do this many monsters then stop and then i'll okay i need to solve the problem of exploration one thing led to another and so i had this proliferating series of problems which i just managed to bring barely under control although to be honest i don't think any human being could play veins of the or run veins of the earth with all of the rules i put in there intact um so it was just me struggling with my um my uh well, I guess developed ambitions as the project went on, and then desperately trying to control them and corral them into something that could actually be published. But yeah, it got big, and the bigness of veins had like massive knock-on effects in it all the way down the line, all the way from trying to print test prints to show to James Raji to I think it nearly broke Jez Gordon, the layout guy, because he was like. Layout for old school D and D problem products is always a challenge. For this, it was like it's massive as you've, as you've seen, and he was like, and just the editing, the layout, the proofreading, the publishing, the cost of it, and finally the finish, like postal service, the cost, of, the postage. It's like if if you told anyone involved with it at the start of it that, that was how big it was going to be, and that was how it was like it's like the Hindenburg. You wouldn't design it if you knew how it was going to end, <laughs> uh, and it just kind of worked because we were all like. Uh, there's like a, a mega project fallacy, which is that if you tell anyone how much a mega project's going to cost, they won't do it. And so the only way to get massive things built, like bridges or tunnels and stuff, is just to lie in an insane way and say, don't worry, we've got it under control, it's going to be easy. And then oh, by the time everyone's sunk their costs into it halfway through, they're like, okay, there's more going to be more costs, more problems, more issues, more challenges. But no, everyone's too scared to back out. So finally a thing gets made. Everyone involved in it is bankrupt, but at least we get a new bridge. And Veins is kind of like that. And everyone involved was kind of messed up. Right? Yeah, I work Slightly in software stylized. development, so I know a bit about lying for new projects. Right. <laughs> so actually, the, the, from what you say, the biggest challenge was uh, actually finishing the project. Yeah. Yeah, and then not just finishing it, but getting it from first draft to layout to proofread to checking all the rules make some degree of sense to publishing. That was a long process. Like several years i think i finished it like several several years before it came out so yeah okay so things was things was being written around the same time as deep carbon observatory was being written they were kind of parallel and you can see how the, the difference in time yeah so also uh what is your favorite part of veins that you are maybe the mo- the most proud of uh i think the darknesses are quite nice I think they're kind of, I don't know how you would use them, but trying to think about the texture of different darknesses was pleasing. I quite like the Darrow, um, but I didn't create those. I stole them from Richard Shaver's schizophrenic imaginings. Uh, and I'm quite pleased with the way that cave development worked out. Some people hate it, the cave generation system, but the fact that, but some people really like it, and a handful of people think it's great. And the fact that I managed to do anything even approximating a useful system, I think, is impressive because I don't think anyone's come anywhere close to doing an easy cave generation system. It's a bit, it's a serious, it's a non-trivial problem to approach. Yeah, I think it's uh, not the same, but similar with with overall generating anything in in in, in RPG. And either you love it or hate it. So so I think it's it goes really both ways. So the random generators of everything, I, I guess. Yeah, so last question about veins. When I was speaking to Kelvin Green, he told me that the least 
the the part that he enjoys the least when creating an RPG product is to create the stats for monsters. <laughs> or, or so, uh, how it is with you? Especially that you have cre created a lot of you have produced a lot of monsters monsters in veins, but. On the on contrary, in uh, Fire on the Velvet Horizon, there is there isn't a single stat block there. So, yeah, uh, Fire is probably what I would prefer. Basically, when I'm doing stats, I work out everything else before them, and then I basically there's I think someone once said, stat it like a bear, and then just go up or down depending on how dangerous you think it should be. And that's roughly what I do. I kind of look for something that's similar to what I want, look at the stats take add or remove things uh, at will and then I give them like one or two special particular things that they'll do, physical things they'll do, like, and not just like, you know in in the immediate like uh, contact, but I'm not a great, uh, like, a, I've, people have spoken to me about doing 5th edition versions of my stuff and I'm just like, no even old school D&D is, that's about my limit for producing coherent sets of numbers, anything more complex than that and it becomes very tiresome to me I don't see it, how, how you could, uh Convert it to fifth edition, not no. <laughs> Especially since I have run the Maze of the Blue Medusa and the Deep Carbon Observatory, and I just, I don't, I don't think the feeling would be the same. Especially the feeling, since uh, and we'll switch to DCO here uh, because uh, Iron, since DCO isn't your uh, classic uh, go and fight monsters in the dungeon adventure, so. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, especially about the observatory, because this was the biggest part of uh, of what I have run in the campaign. Uh, so, what is your idea when creating a dungeon? Because uh, usually people imagine dungeons as as a summary of rooms, and observatory is something much more than the sum of its rooms, and it, it has its feeling and. When when my players were uh, were when exploring the observatory, they were never they they never encountered encountered a room where they checked what's inside the room and said no, we're not interested because we already know what's what's <laughs> in there. So so they never knew actually what's inside. And so so what's your idea when you start to think about the dungeon? Okay, so. DCO was basically, I had two titles for dungeons. Someone, a guy called Zarchov Kowalski wanted me to make a dungeon. I was like, okay. So I had two big titles and I had one, they were based on real life scientific uh, programs. One was called Deep Carbon Observatory. That's a real thing that exists. And the other one was Dark Biosphere Investigations. I went with the observatory and from that point on, I was just imagining what it would be and how it would work. By the time I got to the observatory itself, I was thinking... In every case, I drew out this very simple series of rooms with like, there's one simple loop in it, really. I was thinking, I just iterated and tried to imagine as clearly as possible what, if this entire civilization and this entire culture existed, and people had like, this was like a warehouse or trading station of like, strange underground things, and it had been abandoned relatively quickly, what could things be? And then every piece of room contents, basically, I iterated on until they became interesting to me or until they made some kind of sense. And they had to make sense. They had to have some kind of D&D utility or at least interest. And they had to be beautiful or interesting. And once I got that, I was like, okay, and then basically just cut the pros down. But it, it, it is a bit... I have, I think, I have a bit of a dungeon problem with, like... Uh, art gallery dungeons where I make things that have these kind of static interest in them but I'm, I was really, I don't know if there's that much flow in DCO if the objects are interesting then I guess it's a fun dungeon but if the objects aren't interesting then uh, I think it would be very tiresome One thing I noticed also about DCO that came to my mind right now is that there is no final room there like usually when you people like classically mm. when they imagine a dungeon there is some kind of a final room where, where I don't know the bo the big boss is waiting for you, or mm -hmm. or, or or there is there is the end, the end of the dungeon. And even though you have the you have the lens, even though you have the treasure room, mm -hmm. they never felt like okay, guys, we cleared the dungeon. That's the end of it. So, uh, so was this also something that 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 you wanted to achieve, or or is it, or or I just I, I just made it up. <laughs> I didn't have that specific idea, but I'm glad that I never felt like they'd finished it because it was meant to feel much more like a, a pseudo-naturalistic place than a kind of 
an inherent story. I guess the final room is whatever the giant eats you. And I was when I was imagining what people would do when they came into the dungeon. I mean, there's the basic, the basic OSR motivations, which is I want to explore and find things. I want to fight something, and I want treasure. If you want to explore, you can find the lens, and that's like an entire new reality opens towards you. You can try and go down the chain, which is the same thing. If you want treasure, that's there as well, but it's going to be very hard to get. And if you want to fight something, then yeah, you can get eaten. But it's like, with much of what I do, like the, I expect the people... I try and make things as interesting and as many different dimensions that people can kind of basically bring, create their own meaning in the adventure. That's what I imagine. When you ask why people why they're adventuring, it's meant to be like different for each character and for each player and for each, each combination of player and character. And yet they're all kind of bound together. And there's meant to be hopefully enough there for it to be fulfilling or at least interesting when they go through the adventure and reach whatever its climax happens to be. Yeah. So, so uh, first of all, my it really felt as a place. This 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 observatory. It never felt as a a lot of rooms. It just felt as a place. So that was uh, really really great. And second thing, uh, my players defeated the giant and they used the troll tooths as a uh, troll grenades. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's how they defeated the giant. So uh, okay, and uh, back on the back back to the dungeon. Is uh, is this also a thing that you have created? Uh, it, the dungeon is not flat. I, I, it's it's vertical. I don't know if it's the word uh, the, the proper word. So mm-hmm. it has multiple levels. Uh, the there or there isn't even a particular differentiated. It's it, it, it's not split on levels. So. You just move through the whole place, and mm-hmm. I think this also gives the vibe of uh, lack of the final room, which which is cool. Well, I think most of that comes from the. Const- I worked out relatively early. Okay, this is going to be in like a giant stalactite. That makes sense. That means like it's down and below them, there's nothing. And then I knew they were going to meet the giant at some point. I was like, okay, so there needs to be somewhere for them to run away to. So all of it's built, I think, across one giant central loop. And beyond that, I think I just drew it. I, I think I drew out very, very simply, like, the two main side nights and then um, mm-hmm. started placing rooms in them and thought, what happens if this thing, I meet here, meet here, meet here. Okay, and then tried to imagine, like, the process of play of various different encounters took place. But, yeah, it's um, it's really meant to be, like, one building the whole dungeon really itself is like the main encounter because a lot of dco really is just build up it's like um it's like a the whole everything from the first thing until like you reach the 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 observatory itself it's just one it's meant to be one just massively or slowly increasing like wagnerian symphony of oh this is scary stuff it's gonna happen something's gonna happen you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and things are getting weirder and weirder and weirder and then hopefully like in a a good piece of fiction or horror movie, this the set and setting kind of cre- help to create or meet with the, like, the the final chord or the final like bit, and then it's like okay, now it's like uh, people feel it. We've yeah. finally got there, <laughs> and hopefully there's enough good stuff there that doesn't let people that doesn't let down people's expectations of like this deep and strange things. I mean, it's called Deep Calm Observatory, so everyone who plays the adventure must know that, and they must know like they're going to be going there at some point. So. Uh, just don't let them down when they get to the end. <laughs> yeah, so my, my players, when they got to the lens, they were like, where's the treasure? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. It's, what are you uh, thinking of when you are designing uh, a room? Because a, it's it's really tough to design a, mm-hmm. a room which is... Uh, which ha- which will interest the players, that the, the, which will make them curious to to check. And like I said before, when my players had a glimpse inside any of the rooms, they never had the immediate uh, feeling that, okay, I know what is here. They always had to check it. And I think that's one of the biggest strengths of the DCO. So wh- what, h- how, is your, how, how is your mind working when, when you are designing a dungeon room? Mm, okay. So in a way, the entirety of the rest of the adventure kind of in a way sets these elaborate constraints about what's going to be in any particular part of the dungeon. So when I'm getting, I first so I get to a room, I'm like, there's going to be a room here. I have a quick look around and I imagine right now, 
be honest, doing DCO, I'm not sure I would think of that, but now I would think, are they going to be running away from something? Is this going to be like two trap? Very, very simply, you don't want two traps in a row, you don't want two aggressive monsters in a row, you don't want two weird questioning uh, NPCs in a row, you want them to be like some kind of cognitive or, or, or play like difference, not necessarily strung out like pearls, but some, you want it to be a di- different than things around it. And from that point on, I often start by giving things names. Like I start writing down lists of names of things that it could be, or that could be the title of the room. And then, so there are those constraints. Like I want it to be a living thing. Uh, at this stage of the dungeon, I don't really expect them to have blown their cover or to be fighting stuff yet. So it would be interesting if this would be a thing that was quiet, but could get really loud. I want it to have some degree of opportunity, like, it's just the kind of thing that if you're telling a story or you're exploring a house, you would see it and you would think, oh, that's dangerous, but really interesting. You kind of want it to be something which, like, you kind of, anyone who wants some kind of advantage could look at it and think, mm, something really cool could be in there, yeah. something really amazing, <laughs> or I could do something amazing with that, or if I could rip that out, it might be really useful. And you want it to have the final, like, the final, like, ring of is like, just make it beautiful or imaginatively interesting which is kind of like, I don't know how you, you do that you just try and imagine it you want it to be kind of like everything makes sense That that's the world creation everything things stuff has D&D utility and interest, that's your dungeon stuff and then it kind of, you just try and write, add a little bit of poetry or strangeness to it so that it's uh, has that, that synergizes everything and it just kind of works so I, I tend to write pretty intuitively so like I, I just write it till I think it's okay. There's a bunch of stuff that got deleted or moved around and is forgotten, but uh, yeah. Actually, to be honest, I overwrite it until it's more than okay, and then when I come to put together the dungeon, I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I've got too much text here. But it's a really good idea. I don't want to get rid of it. Maze of the Blue Medusa is a lot like that, where it was like, there's just, it's just very dense. Everything's very, very dense. It is, and... Uh... I, I recently, in Polish, but uh, I, I did a, a long review about Mace of the Blue Medusa, about my actual play, and uh, for Mace, I have to say that it's bi- the biggest problem that I had with Mace, if that is, it was packed up with content, and every, mm-hmm. and every single step where I was going, it was, something was going on there, and it was really hard to follow any objectives. Mm, so, it's, too, so, it's, it's too, there's no flow, it's a, more fun to read than to play, I would, I think. I think if, to make it more better to play, I would take a lot of stuff out and spread it out and just have more like clarity. And it would hit people with the weird stick a lot less, more slowly to begin with. But you know, that, I think that was one of the first dungeons I ever completed. So we had a lot of fun, uh, and I have to say that uh, as for the mega dungeon, it was my first mega dungeon, and uh, and the fact that it was flat, it, it really helped a lot because uh, tracking levels in uh, in mega dungeon is is a pain. In the butt, but but we we have played it and we cleared about about I think almost ninety rooms. So oh, wow. So 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 that's that that was it. We haven't lost uh we haven't lost a player a character there. But we lost some henchmen. Uh, but anyway, we we really had fun. But uh, the, the biggest problem that I had was was the fact that. The players always uh, fought a lot when they will, where they will go. That that was the, the, the biggest problem. Okay, so so just uh, coming back to uh, coming back to Deep Carbon Observatory. So I, I just wanted to share that uh, with you that w- what you said that things are not uh, what they seem to be uh, in the first place. It just just w- w- people were thinking, like my players are thinking, can they use it? What is the, what is it doing? And it was really tempting for them. And the moment they uh, they entered the room when where there was this uh, pool with stuff inside, with the baby, with the sword, mm. etc. And, and th- it was the first time that they saw something uh, so obvious, like. Hey, it's a sword in a pool. <laughs> Fuck it, we're not touching it. So <laughs> <laughs> they did it anyway. But that was the the first impression. So it's so obvious that we cannot touch it. So. That, that's the perfect reaction you want from any D and D situation, which is this thing of like, <laughs> this is clearly so terrible. We're not going to mess with it. But like, that the imp of the perverse just leads you to, yeah, <laughs> you would drink the potion just because part of you wants to find out what happens. Yeah, but I will drink it anyway. So. 
with uh, with Deep Carbon Observatory, I noticed, I noticed uh, and because I, I know a bunch of your work, I noticed that you are cross-creating a kind of uh, setting, I would say, in your products. I don't know if, uh, because I see bits, uh, small pieces of uh, of items of mentioning uh, in Maze of the Blue Medusa and Deep Carbon Observatory, for example, uh, I think Kronia steers are in Deep Carbon Observatory Treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, so you also have this, uh, this star in Deep Carbon Observatory, uh, which is then in veins of the Earth. And it's creating this like the feeling that it's all connected. So is it just uh, putting a good idea from a different product inside a different product or, or is it something you want to create? It's more of the pleasure of inferring it then i don't think i'll ever do it like a, there's no plan to do like one giant creative created world especially because with DD, every group's play experience and world is meant to be different and their own particular reality but i do i always love the idea of it and the feel of it and the sense it builds a sense of possibility and like um uh so it's more for fun uh and there's also i don't know if you know arnold k but he did a whole series of um blog posts about a world of dinosaurs that are traveling in time that are always half a second behind reality um, ages ago, like back in 20 something, 2015, and the, they're in there as well. So there's a kind of like an OSR esque paracosm where I threw in stuff that I liked. Uh, so the, you, there's always the sense, always the sense of something larger where you could step a little bit through something and find like a whole new, a whole new series of reference or adventures. Yeah. But more for fun than due to any like grand plan. It, okay. If I was a smart writer, I would gesture mysteriously and be like, "Ah, yes, ah, the the great plan. Ah, well, maybe if you buy every Force Machine product, Marvel finally, Universe, <laughs> yeah, it will finally be unveiled. But it won't be unveiled. That you'll just get a series of, of like fun, uh, like connections and bits and pieces." Okay, uh, so uh, I also wanted to ask about uh, your style of uh, writing because it's really characteristic. I would say. No one, no one writes. At least in RPG, uh, in RPG uh, fandom, I would say that no one, no one is uh, having the same style as you. And I would say that it's really dense. Like it, it's, yeah, it it is, and it makes it makes me think uh, a lot. And I don't know if it's I like it as a as a as a reader. <laughs> but but as a dungeon master, as a dungeon master, sometimes I hate you. <laughs> and I wanted to ask because it's a uh, it's a really great thing to read. And uh, I forgot the question right now. So uh, you are uh, have you ever thought about uh, compromising or not this style, or or have you ever had any doubts? Because I think it's worth to have people like you writing stuff like that because I think it styles up the hobby, I would say. Right. But, uh, so, but you wouldn't want everyone to be doing it because everything would be like an incoherent pretension. Oh, if everything would be like that, I, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I had like a similar series of thoughts. Like there have definitely been times when I, I try and pack a lot of stuff, both rhythmically and euphonically, but also in terms of utility into every sentence. And especially when I was younger and I was writing those books like i think veins in particular was just like very very hard on like the um the euphony but and i had the same thought as you which is i could make the i could spread this out or reduce the density and make it easier to understand or more more easier for more people to understand more, more easily but like you say people are already doing that um and i kind of know like i know what the american like standard Forgotten Realm style is. I know what a few other people's style is. It's a, it's a world where everyone's writing this very simple ticker tape, plane of grass, plane of glass prose, which is like easy to deal with, easy to, like good utility, doesn't worry the customer. And I'm like, that's that's actually good because you know there's nothing really wrong with utility or like people finding stuff easy to use. But because everyone's already doing it, I thought I may as well just go for it and have fun and make my own bonkers version of it. If I was the if I was if I'd invented D and D and I was doing it on my own, I would probably exercise a lot more control over my prose and try and make it simpler and more clear because I would be really worried that people didn't understand. But I kind of know like I'm a weird shaman sitting on a mountain, so 
I think people who read my stuff kind of know where we're gonna we're gonna go for it this time. Yeah, but it really works on 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 people's imagination. I think uh, mm-hmm. every everywhere in the in the in the internet or when I when I speak to my friends, they are they are familiar with your work, so they confirm that it, it's really it's really it re- it's really working when when you try to imagine such things. And I think it's doing a, a really tons of good job in terms of describing, especially alien things. So mm-hmm. if you would describe me, uh, I don't know, uh, a cat. Then I would be angry, but you are describing stuff like atomic beasts, like anti, like anti phoenix, and and things like that. So it really works, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Where was I? Like, yeah, I think. Well, okay. Two things. Firstly, there's like a a standard unresolvable polarity in RPGs between utility and clarity, and this happens across writing, across the imagination, and across layouts, everything. It's like you want it to feel strange and encrusted with weirdness and to be a thing where you pick it up and you're like, what the hell is this? And it gives you that feeling you had when you were 12 and you see an RPG book and you're just like, what? And you open it and there's this there's a slightly cryptic world inside and which you know you don't understand, but you kind of want to. And it's that sense of like kind of a deep down uh, otherness. Or do you want it to be something that people can functionally use? And I think it's good that there are things that go all the way across that spectrum in various ways because i don't think you can i don't think you can ever have a perfect version if you go for full clarity you lose something and if you go for full weirdness you also lose something so it's better to have a full culture and with making things weird or describing alien things honestly i think you can make a lot of a really really valuable skill when you're writing in any way or especially doing or dungeon mastering is just to try and imagine everything you see as if you're seeing it directly for the first time without any reference, without any cultural background to it, and you're just trying to describe it as if it's there, but you're just using the terminology and like the connections and the the, the like the version stuff that you kind of you can pull from immediately and you're trying to describe everything as if it was strange. If you try and describe a, a goblin or even a cat, as you mentioned, as if you'd never seen one before and try and make it completely novel but also beautiful, then you have to do a lot of interesting work inside your head. And that it kind of restrangifies the world. It makes like the quotidian or the normal kind of glow with like the 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 end, like the wonder of exploration. Uh, hopefully, maybe sometimes it's a good technique or uh, a good a good like exercise. Yeah, as for the combining the usability and the weirdness, uh, I, I'm totally with you on this. That uh, there are these two opposite opposite uh, sides uh, in, in the hobby, but. I got to say, and I don't want to. I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but I think the observatory is a perfect combination of both for me. <laughs> so you you have a lot of really great uh, things to use as a as a player, as a as a DM, and and just just a fun stuff to play with, and also uh, this sense of weirdness. Uh, I have combined your uh, Deep Carbon Observatory with uh, Zarkov's uh, Going Through Forbidden Other Worlds. So oh. it had a very good switch because both of these adventures are this kind of science fantasy, I would say, some st- mm. something like that. So, so yeah, and 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 um, I'm I'm also uh, I, I also like that uh, people are having their style because uh, aside you, I think Kelvin Green is having a very uh, Distinguished style. He he he's, he he writes these light adventures, and and uh, it's very characteristic of him. And the third one, I would say, Zarkov is he he's full of irony. I think, yeah. So yeah, uh, he he's stuff. He, he's the stuff has a really particular um, tonality to it, and he's really good at like uh, D like proper what I would consider like proper D and D. I don't know the stuff that I'm not that great at, like puzzles, like uh, encounter design. Just like solid adventure design stuff, where I'm like, uh, I'd probably try and do something weirder and more pretentious. Since Archive is just like has a very like solid grasp of it. Yeah, I, I also like his adventures a lot, but let's not make it about him. <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, are you right now nowadays uh, playing D and D a lot or RPGs at all? Uh, I'm only in one game at the moment. I'm in a game with my friend. He's running it, and we are in a version of ancient Rome, and we're exploring a giant tree, like a three-mile-high tree with a bunch of uh, Roman and Celtic 
adventurers and my character <laughs> typically is I've lost like I don't know how many first or second or third level characters a lot uh, and so what's happened is that one of them the initial one was the adherent to a weird Carthaginian Etruscan goddess and so even though all the characters have died they've passed along the legend of this alien goddess which has become kind of a micro cult and so now whenever a new character dies, like the religion itself grows on and the story gets incorporated into whatever it is they're doing. But uh, I, do, I, I don't really run D&D much anymore because, holy crap, it takes it out of me. Like, it just, it's a lot of work, um, and I enjoy being around people when I'm playing, but I, doing that and writing at the same time, I don't have it in me. But it's nice to play. Yeah, so so nice to hear that uh, you are playing because usually people who design products are hardcore dungeon masters, and I, I'm quite I'm quite surprised that that you you are prefer to be a D and D player. So, and I think maybe maybe uh, this will be the last question, uh, but may, maybe a long one. Do you like when a player character dies? Because I remember, uh, especially in, with Giant in Deep Carbon Observatory, I remember this quote that if you won't kill a, a single a single player character with the Giant, then you are doing something wrong. And I know it was a joke, like, but uh, well, or not, <laughs> but uh, your products seem to be the, 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 what you write, what you create. They are very dangerous. Like, mm. and not even in in a sense of stat blocks or, or or pure strength, but they are usually terrifying horror monsters. Maybe not usually, but a lot of them is terrifying horror monsters or alien monsters. So, uh, what what is your what is your take on player character death in your adventures? I think that's a good question because it brings us close to something that's difficult to describe. I think. I, do, I think the not it's okay if you fetishize it and take it too seriously and too directly it could come to a kind of fetishization of death like i lost this many characters i killed your character this way it's not necessarily about that it's about not about death itself but the imminence and the possibility of death the fact that it can happen it might be irreversible it might probably won't be chaotic like it could just come out of nowhere but it isn't meant to be just like this random not a completely random pointless possibility like like multiple serious threats that integrates into the world where they can be incredibly dangerous but if you use your imagination and if you think and if you investigate the things around you and if you like uh, pay really careful attention if you work together you can win I think almost every adventure that I've done it's not meant to be impossible it's meant to be difficult and at any point, you or your character can think, okay, I've had enough, and you can leave. And that's also a valid choice. So it's not necessarily about like worshipping death as like a part of the game. It's about the necessity of a genuine and real threat existing, and it being largely something that can be defeated most of the time, but with a dab of chaos. So you might get insanely lucky and kill the giant with one blow, or come up with some clever, like, uh, some clever tactic, and sometimes, occasionally, there can be unfair deaths, and I don't have a clear exploration of why that's... It feels like an unnaturalistic world if everything is completely fair, even if it's dangerous. There has to be some possibility for things to go completely wrong, even if you did everything right. I don't know why that feels like it works for me, but it feels like it makes the world like a living thing. And if the world is dangerous, complicated, if things make sense, which we talked about throughout the entirety of the interview, like the pseudo sense of all the different bits and pieces has to sort of work together, so it's not just completely random. And then the world feels like this big, complex living thing, which is potentially dangerous, and I hope is that people get enraptured by that, and the danger and the possibility kind of draw them in and makes them ask the questions and think the thoughts that make it a real in their game because when people are really interested and a bit scared and they know they might die but they know they might get away with something and they're kind of looking around they're asking questions they're thinking they're asking the dm stuff the dm's asking questions and that process basically woof, creates like an entire reality yeah. and death is a very like a little type of death is like the antimatter that fuels that yeah. not too much uh but yeah, but I think it's the ultimate price that character player character can pay, and and that 
if anything, like you said, not to fetishize the, the player character there and not to brag about how many characters were died, died during the adventure, but I think it also helps with the with how you how you feel your player character that it it makes it alive actually that it might yeah. die. Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, to 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 wrap it up uh, where above okay one more question because I have one more question sorry. How is the how is the Deep Carbon Observatory uh, remastered sales going? And was it a was it a success? Uh, how do you feel? Uh, how how would you sum it up? Because it it had a very successful Kickstarter. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it did the it did okay. okay it basically kept me got me in scrap scrap and I because really scrap princess isn't part of everything that I do, but it's part of like ninety percent. And in terms of we haven't talked about it very much, but in terms of DCO and veins, they're very much like a strong co-partner. But yeah. The DCO Kickstarter kept us going for about a year <laughs> while we worked on a bunch of other stuff. And then a bunch of other projects have fallen through because there's meant to be other stuff published by now. And so now we are working on... And then it kicked, it did what it usually did. Like it went boom, tailed off gradually, and then it tailed off to about like one or two authors a week. And then Ben Milton did a review on Questing Beast. Mm-hmm. And then it went back up and he like had to sold a bunch more. And now it's tailing off again. And hopefully soonish. By the end of the year, we'll have another adventure kickstarted, and we'll see if we're still any good at this. But um, it did really well, I think, for me as like an independent. It was the first thing I kickstarted. So I did a book of poetry before it, but it was the first thing I kickstarted, which was like, okay, you can probably do this on your own, and you can probably survive doing this on your own. So it was like a a big deal for me. And now I have to see if I can do the same thing, but instead of just making an old idea and doing like the the posh version, I can do like new ideas but my hope and my dream is to continue to do new products and to basically have a false machine publishing thing where i have like a bunch of different books so i i have because i have to say it because uh, except above above the, the the fact that it's really a top quality adventure from my perspective that i, I was really amazed uh, by the quality of the physical product because uh, I have to say that right now uh, we have some kind of, uh, I don't know, honeymoon with the OSR industry and people are kickstarting stuff here and there. Yeah. And, and it's, I would say, usually it's not that great when you get the final product in your hand. But uh, I was really shocked when I got the Deep Carbon Observatory Remastered physical copy, except uh, a corner was smashed in in the in the oh. mail. But, so so, but, but no no problem. It's it's not your fault. Like, actually, the post service in Poland is total. I don't want to comment it. But uh, I was really amazed on how it looks, how it feels, and and I also wanted to say to you that it really stands out for me for the from last year because it was last year, right? Yeah. 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 So so it really stands out. Uh, also in the terms of quality of paper of, of the book overall yeah because people are like people are paying a fair amount for it like we tried to set the cost so it's like the it's cast a bomb to send anywhere so the cost of the book plus the cost of the postage is meant to be roughly equivalent to a buying a um an, a standard D book off the shelf mm-hmm. and to be honest Having really high quality paper and high quality binding and lots of ribbons and stuff is one of the easiest things you can add to a book. There's no admin costs to that, and you don't have to like redo the layout or anything. You can just say, "All right, increase the paper thickness." Um, it's just, it's like unless it's going to massively increase the weight, it's like an okay thing to do. And because there's no company, it's just me and Scrap, and we do all, we did almost everything on that ourselves, including the layout. Like the less people you have involved, and the more skills you have. We can sell the book at that price and still make a reasonable profit for like a year and still make a really high quality thing. Admittedly, it took ages to make and we're trying to, there's probably some proofreading errors and we're going to try and improve the layout for the next one. But why not pass it along to the customer with like a really high quality book? You paid for it, you kickstarted it. Like it, it's, uh, and again, everything I publish is like over here on a shelf. That's my wall of self esteem whenever I'm feeling sad. <laughs> I can look over and be like, okay, there's a book that I wrote, there's a book that I wrote, the book that I wrote, and the book looks, looks like crap to me. It's like, what's the point? Like, it's yeah. um, it's only half a business, really. It's maybe two artists who are trying to get away with creating original art, and then we just staple the business onto it like Frankenstein, and then 
<laughs> try and make a profit of it somehow. Yeah. That's for now. In 10 years, talk to me and I'll be like a corrupt mess who just doesn't <laughs> care about anything and I'll be like... Yeah, it, it had <laughs> it. Heading wizards of the coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Join, 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 join my Discord. Like and subscribe. Exactly. So, uh, okay. I, I got when you when you mentioned binding and uh, and stuff like that. I, I I recall one thing. Do you have a I do have a thing for a funny format because Deep Carbon Observatory is not exactly a four, and Mates of the Blue Medusa is also uh, I would say a bit. It, it's not B five. So. Uh, Maze, I didn't have anything to do with layouts. All of the glory yeah. on that goes to Ken and uh, our layout person whose name I've forgotten, I'm afraid. DCO is meant to be A4. I think it's it, a bit higher. I have it on my shelf. It? I have it on my shelf and huh. and it's a bit higher than, than other A4 books. Okay, then in that case, that's an accident because it's meant okay. the, the, <laughs> the main pages are meant to be A4, so maybe it's just the way the binding worked out. Uh, All right. It was not intentional. I, I, I don't deliberately pick like the weird, uh, the weirdest possible like formats. It's just development. It's how things turn out. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, so at the end, I wanted to uh, to ask you uh, where can people find you, except for your work, uh, like veins of the Earth, Deep Carbon Observatory, and you you run a blog. Yeah, if you just Google Force Machine or Patrick Stewart RPG, if you go to my blog. Uh, at the top right, you can find a where to find me. So there's the store is there, and there's a list. There's a where to find me page that brings up all of my like Tumblr and my Instagram and my Twitter. I'm on Twitter as P James Stewart. If you just Google any combination of those, you'll be brought to like a string of like my social medias, which all center on the blog largely and lead to each other. So uh, you should be able to track me down the other woods. Okay, so. Thank you very much for this conversation. It was a blast. I, I really, I, it's really fun to talk to to a guy who wrote a product that I run with my friends. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure to speak to you as well, Christoph. <laughs>